So hi, um, it's the first time to answer your question. <laughs> the point is that you don't need the full power of the random oracle. Like there's like a nice simple primitive here that you can define a uh, succinct proof with this incompressibility uh, property and it's enough. Okay, so hi. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm Nir, and uh, I want to tell you about uh, around optimal statistical uh, zero-knowledge arguments, and uh, this is uh, joint work with Omer Panef. And uh, in case uh, you've just uh, joined, uh, sorry, good. So in case uh, you just uh, joined uh, the session, let me remind you what uh, zero-knowledge protocols are. Um, so here we have a prover that interacts with the verifier in order to uh, prove some. Uh, uh, statement and uh, the most basic requirement is of course completeness if the statement is true we want the verifier to accept the second requirement is soundness if the statement is false the verifier should reject with overwhelming probability and uh, of course we have the zero knowledge requirement that essentially says that the verifier should not be able to learn anything meaningful from the uh, proof and the way that this is uh, captured is using the simulation paradigm and requiring that there exists an efficient simulator that can simulate an interaction out of thin air without ever uh, uh, speaking with the uh, prover uh, in the sense that the simulated interaction should be indistinguishable from a real one. Now, as you may know, this notion comes in many colors and uh, uh, flavors. And uh, in this work, we consider one uh, uh, main variant um, of, of zero knowledge, which is the statistical zero knowledge arguments. So what are these? As the name suggests, here we really want that the simulated interaction is statistically indistinguishable from a real interaction. And uh, this is a very appealing uh, uh, property in the sense that it provides some sort of uh, everlasting uh, privacy, even if the verifier stores the interaction and post-processes it for a very long time, for unbounded time, it still doesn't gain any meaningful information. Now, um, statistical zero-knowledge systems for general uh, MP languages are unlikely to also be statistically sound, which is why we uh, relax the soundness requirement to only hold against computationally bounded uh, provers, and these may definitely exist for all of NP. Okay, so the, the question that we focus on in this work is, is a natural one, and uh, it's around complexity of such uh, um, arguments. Uh, how much interaction do you need in order to achieve statistical zero knowledge? So let me tell you a little bit about what we know and also compare it to what we know about computational zero knowledge. Um, so we know that some interaction is required. In particular, even computational zero knowledge cannot be achieved in uh, uh, two, message, in two messages. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we've known for quite a while now how to achieve zero knowledge in four messages based on standard assumptions for statistical zero knowledge, specifically collision resistant uh, hash functions. Okay, so what is the exact round complexity of, of zero knowledge? What about uh, uh, free messages? Uh, can we have such protocols? And here we know that there is a, a difficulty. We know in particular that you cannot have protocols with uh, black box simulations. Uh, but nevertheless, in the computational setting, for computational zero knowledge, there do exist uh, protocols, so uh, protocols uh, under a non-falsifiable knowledge assumption have existed for quite a while, and more recently uh, uh, there's also a, a protocol based on a falsifiable assumption on the multi-collision resistance of Kiddush hash functions. Uh, you heard a little about it from uh, Cody, and we're going to touch it again uh, in a bit. So what about statistical zero knowledge? Here we basically uh, don't know much. Uh, in fact, there are no protocols, not even under non-standard assumptions, including knowledge assumptions, uh, at least if we're thinking about general attackers, general non-uniform attackers. And uh, this is where our work uh, comes in. 
So our main result is a statistical zero-knowledge protocol with optimal uh, round complexity, namely uh, free messages, assuming uh, keyless multi-collision resistant hash functions and uh, other standard assumptions that uh, you can instantiate, for example, from uh, uh, LWV. So this basically matches the same assumptions used uh, before for computational zero-knowledge, but achieves a stronger statistical um, guarantee. OK, so uh, comparing to uh, previous four message protocols, then uh, uh, we don't improve the, uh, the assumptions here, but only the, the round complexity. But we also show in this work a four message protocol that relax, relaxes the assumption previously required from, uh, multi, from uh, collision resistance to multi-collision uh, resistance. OK. So these are the results, and, and let me uh, tell you a little, bit, a little bit more about what are these multi-collision resistant hash functions in case uh, you haven't encountered them uh, so far. So here we're considering shrinking function by at least some uh, uh, um, linear factor. And uh, in such functions, there not only exist pairs of collisions, there also exist much larger tuples that sort of map to the same uh, output, we call them M collisions. And naturally, you can define a relaxation of uh, collision resistance called M uh, collision resistance that says that it's hard to find such M tuples. Okay. So this is really a, a natural relaxation. Uh, but uh, something very interesting about it is that it also makes sense for fixed functions, for functions that don't have a key. So we know that in the case of, of collision-resistant hash functions, the attacker could always have uh, um, uh, a hardwired collision in its code. That this is uh, uh, unavoidable. Now, it's also the case for uh, 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 multi-collisions. You can always have a polynomial-sized collision hardwired in your code, but you can require that you cannot do better than that in the sense that a non-uniform attacker that has non-uniform advice of size s should not be able to find multi-collisions of size significantly larger than s. Okay. So um, it's a pretty simple uh, assumption. It's falsifiable. Um, it may hold for uh, certain uh, um, existing hash functions, like, say, uh, uh, SHA. Um, but nevertheless, it's new at this point, it should be considered uh, non-standard. We don't understand it well enough, and I'll get to this point uh, towards the end of the talk um, again. OK, so this is uh, multi-collision resistant hash functions. And um, in the rest of the time that I have, I'd like to give you uh, a taste of the techniques. Yeah, this was taken yesterday at lunch uh, right here. Um, OK. So let me start by giving you a general template for uh, constructing zero-knowledge protocols, um, which was sort of uh, uh, followed in, in, in the previous work that, that constructed computational zero-knowledge in, uh, in free messages. And, uh, and here we have two steps for the protocol. And the first step, the prover and verifier run a sub-protocol to establish some sort of trap door. And then in the second step, the prover proves that either the statement x is correct or that it knows this uh, secret trapdoor. Now, the point is that this trapdoor should be hard to find. And so if the prover manages to convince the verifier, it must be the case that the statement is true. Uh, at the same time, a simulator that has the code of the verifier, unlike the prover, can somehow extract this trapdoor and use it to generate the proof. So the proof is going to be what we call witness indistinguishable, meaning that the verifier cannot really tell whether it's given a proof that uses the actual witness for x or this trapdoor witness. And this is the way that you argue uh, zero knowledge. OK, so where does this fit uh, uh, into our picture? So the previous work that constructed uh, computational zero knowledge in, uh, in free messages basically showed how to implement this uh, uh, trapdoor uh, phase. And then you can couple that with off-the-shelf uh, witness indistinguishable 
uh, proofs of knowledge uh, in free messages to get a protocol. So um, you could expect that uh, in order to get free message uh, statistical zero knowledge, the change that you have to make is really get statistical witness indistinguishable arguments of knowledge. And this is really more or less uh, the case. So we do use the, the trapdoor uh, phase in, uh, in previous works with some natural tweaks that I'm not going to get uh, into in this talk. Uh, the main focus is really on obtaining these uh, uh, statistically witness indistinguishable uh, argu arguments of knowledge. And uh, as a matter of fact, our understanding of statistical uh, WI, witness indistinguishability, has not been much better than that of statistical zero knowledge. Uh, in fact, up until recently, uh, it was very much the same as statistical zero knowledge. And very recently, there was a very nice protocol that achieved uh, statistical WI in just two messages. Uh, but it's not an argument of knowledge. Well, we really need an argument of knowledge here because this trapdoor, it always exists. The, the point is that it should be hard uh, to find. It should be hard to show that you actually know it, that you can efficiently um, extract it. OK. So this is the sort of the technical uh, focus of this work. And uh, I want to tell you uh, how we do it. Do we have a clock somewhere? Uh, OK. Uh, well, I'm the last doc, so uh, I'm going to forget about time. Um, yeah. Uh, if you get bored, just leave. Uh, so, um, OK, so I want to tell you how to construct these uh, statistical WI uh, arguments. And for that, I'm going to recall how like, classical computational WI arguments uh, work. So here, in the first uh, uh, step, the prover uh, takes some string. You know, classically, it represents, say, some graph. And it computes uh, bit commitments to the corresponding uh, bits, send them over to the verifier. We then send a bunch of random challenges, basically asking that the prover opens some of these uh, bits. The prover opens some commitments, and then the verifier decides whether to accept or not. Okay. Now, as you may expect, uh, if you use statistically hiding bit commitments, then you do actually get statistical witness indistinguishability. So what's the problem? The problem is that statistical, uh, statistically hiding uh, bit commitments cannot be achieved non-interactively. And this is inherent. Uh, and it's the same situation as in collision-resistant hash functions. Because it's statistically hiding, collisions do exist, and they can always be uh, hard-coded. OK. So we need to do uh, something else. And we're going to uh, um, uh, rely on a weaker definition of binding. We'll, and let me tell you what, uh, what it says. So here, too, we'd like to uh, commit uh, to, a, to a bit string. And uh, just as before, we'd like to be able to open a certain subset of the bits. And we want, it's important, that the, the unopened bits remain statistically hidden. Okay? And this is just like in uh, plain uh, bit commitments. But we are going to ask for a much weaker uh, uh, binding guarantee. What we're going to ask for is that for any uh, efficient attacker, there's basically a short list, a polynomial size list of strings, so that whenever he opens up a subset of, uh, of the commitments, they must be simultaneously consistent with one of these strings. Okay? So we might be able to open each individual bit in any way that it wants by choosing one of these strings, but it cannot mix and match. Okay? So this is sort of the object that uh, we want to get. And I want to uh, argue that this is actually sufficient to get uh, um, an argument of knowledge. And Intuitively, the reason is that if you have an attacker that convinces the verifier of accepting with some noticeable probability, this attacker has a corresponding polynomial size set. And there also exists an attacker that with polynomially smaller but still noticeable probability convinces the verifier while being consistent with one of these strings. And this allows a reduction to the uh, previous setting where we really had 
the classical notion of binding. Okay. So this is uh, um, really uh, what we want. Um, and uh, as we said, uh, it's enough. And the, the last thing that I want to do is give you some clue on, on how to construct uh, uh, this object. OK. So the, constru the, the construction is pretty uh, uh, simple to describe and it relies on, on two tools. So the first tool is weakly binding strict, strict, uh, string commitments that don't have this subset opening property. Namely, you can open the entire commitment, okay? No bit will, be, uh, will remain hidden. And this is something that you can actually do based on uh, multi-collision uh, uh, resistance. The construction is completely analogous to that of statistically highly commitment from collision resistance. Um, the second tool is something that you all know, which is threshold secret sharing. So here I'd like to be able to take uh, a bit um, and encode it into a bunch of uh, uh, symbols with the, the following two properties. So uh, first, as long as I reveal not too many uh, symbols, less than, than my uh, uh, threshold, then B remains perfectly hidden. Okay? And the second thing is that these encodings, if I have uh, uh, an encodings of, of different bits, they must be far apart, okay? They can only agree on less than uh, uh, T symbols. And indeed, we know that if you have T symbols, you can already sort of recover the, uh, the secrets. So these are the, the basic two uh, things that we need. And, and with that, let me uh, describe the, the construction. So we have our, our bit string, which we'd like to uh, commit to. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to compute uh, a secret sharing encoding to each and every one of uh, uh, these bits, put it in corresponding uh, columns. Then we're going to compute these weakly binding commitments to each one of the encodings. And now we're going to take another copy of this matrix and also, compu also compute commitments to the rows. Okay? And this is basically going to be our commitment. Okay, so it's, it's basically just uh, commitments to the columns and rows of this secret sharing matrix. Good, so how do we open a subset? So first, naturally, we would open the corresponding encodings, namely the columns corresponding to the uh, um, subset that we want to open. Uh, but we're not going to stop at that. The opening procedure is actually randomized. So the receiver is going to pick at random a few random rows, not more than the uh, threshold, and also asks that the sender opens the commitments for these rows. OK. So I'm not going to uh, uh, prove anything, but let me wave my hands a little bit to convince you why this uh, uh, thing works. Um, Um, right, we forgot to say that the verifier at the end should, of course, uh, check consistency that uh, these encodings are really valid encodings and also that it has consistency between the rows and uh, the columns. Okay, so first, let me argue that this thing uh, is hiding. And this is the case, really, because for the bits that we do not open, we only reveal very few coordinates of their corresponding encodings, so we're protected by the secret sharing privacy guarantee. Okay. The more interesting part is uh, arguing weak binding, uh, and why does that uh, intuitively hold? Okay, so these column commitments, we understand that they're already uh, bound uh, uh, the sender to a few encodings for each and every one of the bits. But it may still be that it could somehow independently uh, open them. Um, in particular, assume for simplicity that it can open one encoding of zero and one encoding of one for each and every one of the bits. We want to make sure that it cannot mix and match. Okay? And this is exactly what these uh, cross checks are for. This is why we open also the rows. And the intuition is that if you fix any two such encodings of different bits and you choose random locations, enough random locations, then because they're far apart, then with very high probability, we're going to fix one of them. Okay? So as a matter of fact, if you choose your parameters right, 
then these tests are actually going to fix the entire uh, bit string of the sender. And this is computationally fixed, not uh, information theoretically fixed. OK, now where does this uh, small set of uh, strings come from? So what's important here is that the sender is also bound by its commitment to the rows. OK? So basically, for uh, uh, this random selection, there are only very few uh, sort of uh, openings that you can present. And this directly maps to very few strings that it can eventually open. OK. So this is a little bit about the uh, construction. You're welcome to ask me more about it uh, offline. Um, yeah, so before I finish, I want to give you some, uh, some food for uh, uh, thought. Um, so you've heard now in this talk and in the previous talk already about uh, two primitives that seem to inherently require some sort of setup or a key, simply because, you know, like hardwiring attacks uh, exist. And the fascinating question is really, can we get uh, meaningful security even without like, such randomized setup? And, and this is not only interesting from a theoretical perspective, it's also a practical concern, because this, this is what we do all the time, right? We use SHA for collision resistant. We don't sample keys uh, for collision resistant uh, uh, hash functions. So in this talk, and also in the previous ones, we've seen that at least you can formulate meaningful security guarantees for such uh, fixed uh, functions, or uh, in that case, it was uh, um, uh, SNARKs. And uh, I think it's, it's fascinating to, to understand this, because we're speaking about a completely different type of hardness. It's very different from the average case hardness uh, um, we're used to and, and love so much in, uh, in cryptography. It would be uh, uh, very interesting to get any kind of formal evidence uh, beyond you know, assuming this thing as an atomic assumption on a certain, you know, on SHA or on a, a different function, which I think is also reasonable, but you know, it would be very, it would be great if we can get like actual reductions to different forms of hardness. So we're not there yet, and I encourage uh, all of you or some of you uh, uh, to think about it. And uh, this is uh, all that uh, I wanted to tell you. Thanks. Thank you, Nir. Any questions? All right, so let's thank Nir and other speakers. <laughs>